Welcome back to the channel, everyone. Today, I wanted to talk about some recent research, which got translated into several news articles that have been making their rounds about Antarctic insects. Uh, but first, please like and subscribe. It helps me out a lot, helps the channel grow. So this article that has come out is specifically about the Antarctic midge, which is the only terrestrial insect that is endemic to continental Antarctica. And this midge is pretty interesting in that it is extremely well adapted, as you would imagine, to high vo high velocity winds, extremely cold temperatures, uh, extremely damp conditions, things like that. Uh, if you've never heard of this midge, it's called Belgica Antarctica, and it is a coronamid midge. And if you aren't familiar with coronamids, coronamids look like this. Uh, they are a bit mosquito-like, except for that they don't have a piercing sucking mouth. These are usually referred to as the non-biting midges. They're a group of fairly primitive flies, as you can tell from their antennae here. More advanced flies tend to have aerostate antennae, whereas the more primitive flies tend to have these sort of segmented antennae. And with coronamids, their antennae tend to be extremely plumose or feather-like, like you see here, uh, being more plumose than the males. Uh, and they're fairly easy to identify they tend to be associated with either fresh water or damp soil. And so in Antarctica, where there's plenty of water everywhere, you can imagine that the coronamids are fairly well adapted for these. But the interesting thing about Belgica Antarctica, the coronamid found in, Antar in Antarctica, is that it doesn't really look like its relatives in the, chrono in the coronamids. And you can see here, they're all black, and that makes it very difficult for distinguishing detail. So I actually prefer looking at line drawings of these because if you're just looking at that at them in nature, they're extremely hard to see. Uh, even when they're by themselves, you can't really make out the detail. But with line drawings, you can. So this is what the this coronamid Belgica Antarctica looks like. The male tends to be a little smaller. This is the male here, and they have these obvious genitalia on the back. These are abdominal claspers, which they use to clasp the female which you can see uh, going on here. This is their mating ritual. And the male, so the ten, uh, the males tend to be smaller. They have these abdominal claspers. The females tend to be a little larger. They don't have very much in the way of external genitalia, but their genitalia is irreversible, so they can uh, bring it in and out of their abdomen. Unlike other chronomids, they don't have those big bushy antennae. They have much smaller antennae. And this is likely because, uh, if I had a guess, likely because they aren't flying anywhere specifically. Generally, those sorts of super bushy plumose antennae are used to find mates uh, while in flight. Those plumose antennae tend to have a lot of sensilli, so nerve sensors on it to smell out mates. These are wingless their entire life. At no point do these flies develop wings, so they're not flying anywhere, so it's probably not super useful to be able to smell super well. This Belgica species is wingless. You can see what's left of the wings there, but this is likely an adaptation to the extreme wind in Antarctica. Antarctica, especially on the continent, uh, not only is it extremely cold, but they have some of the worst winds on Earth. And species that end up being introduced into Antarctica or the outer islands of Antarctica have to deal with this wind uh, and usually with insects with wings, when they're exposed to this kind of wind, they either can't take off at all, or the wings just become shredded in these extremely brutal winds. So there's no point in flying, so this species just doesn't have wings. What is cool about them is how they survive in Antarctica. So one, they do tend to burrow slightly either under the snow, or if there's some exposed soil, or, or uh, loose ice, things like that. And this burrowing helps them maintain a certain level of insulation against the cold. Uh, even just moving down a centimeter or two under the snow or under soil will provide a lot of insulation and prevent you from going underneath kind of the lethal thermal limit for most insects, which is minus 15 degrees C. So th that little level of insulation helps a lot. Additionally, they accumulate antifreeze compounds in their blood, and this is not particularly rare in insects. A lot of insects that overwinter, even in temperate conditions, which have to deal with sub-freezing temperatures, will accumulate complex sugars in high concentrations in the blood or in the hemolymph. 
and this will help them to resist freezing. It's, it takes a lot colder temperature to freeze sugar water than it does regular water. So uh, this prevention in freezing will stop cellular damage from occurring. Larvae, which lived for two years in Antarctica of the species. So again, very, very dark larvae, not a lot to see here. So I prefer the line drawings. This is what a coronamid larva looks like. The larvae live for two years before they become an adult and they will feed on basically anything. The adults are non-feeding. The larvae will feed on basically any detritus it can find on the ground, which is not surprising considering that there's not much uh, to feed on in Antarctica other than some lichens or mosses or things. But the larvae are extremely tolerant to cold and extremely intolerant to warmth. So any sort of prolonged exposure to temperatures above about 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees C will cause them to die. Um, and some of this research that was just recently published goes into the temperature thresholds for a lot of their development. And I will link to that research as well, as well as the news articles. But how these larvae survive, uh, it's over a two-year process. They will go through a, a first season, so summer into winter, and then they will go dormant in the winter, this quiescent state. In the next year, over from summer to winter, they will be active again and then enter a state called diapause. And diapause is a genetically predetermined kind of hibernation that some insects do. And it is done in order to arrest development and then time your usually either egg hatching or development into an adult or into a pupa along certain either photo period events or temperature events. And it's this timing is usually for species that find it necessary for survival to be able to very accurately time the emergence of an adult or the hatching of an egg or something like that. So in the second year of winter, the larvae will enter a state of diapause and they will wait for the temperature to get above a certain threshold. And then all of the diapause breaks for all of the larvae for the entire area that these larvae live in, which isn't you know that big of an area. If you look at a map, here is a map of where they're found in continental Antarctica. It's just on this outer peninsula because otherwise it's probably just too cold. But they all emerge at once from this diapause state, pupate, and then go into their adult stage simultaneously. And this simultaneous emergence into the adult stage allows them to find each other to mate and lay eggs because they don't live for very long as adults. The adults don't feed and also the adults are going to be extremely limited in their mobility, not having wings. And also, as soon as cold temperature starts to set in, it will kill the adults. So they have to time this extremely well, which is the purpose of this stage called, called diapause. Uh, after the adults mate, they lay their eggs. Uh, the females will coat the eggs in a antifreeze-like jelly to prevent freezing and desiccation, and then promptly die. It's a very uh, cool insect in that it's figured out a way to live in literally the worst possible environment, which all other insects have not been able to do. So I'll link to all of the articles that I was talking about in the description if you want to read them yourself, and I'll talk to you guys later.